for being on. This is awesome. You are, you're the third in my YouTube ones, by the way, this zoom recording stuff has been fantastic. Like for me as a producer. So this is really, really exciting. The first like double conversation. I don't know how to explain that anyway. <laughs> Uh, but thanks for being on. And uh, like I was just telling you a second ago, uh, we're expecting our newest joiner into the family uh, come October and doing all this research and trying to figure things out. Um, I figure there's nobody better to talk to following your stuff about where getting your information, how to decipher whether it's the, the stuff you're taking in is legit because there's such a wide variety of information on pregnancy, postpartum, fitness, birth, the, the whole run of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first, thanks for having us <laughs> in the double whammy. Um, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, for those listening, I'm Lindsay. I'm founder and CEO of BirthFit. And then the other voice, I'll let Leah introduce herself. Yeah, I'm Leah, and I... Um, also work within the BirthFit staff and alongside Lindsay, um, especially now that she came to Texas, I, I'm somewhat closer to her. Um, but yeah, we really, um, I guess between the two of us have, you know, wear a lot of hats. Um, yeah. Lindsay wears a whole lot of hats and, and she can talk about that. And I kind of mix birth with um, owning and working in a strength and conditioning facility as a coach, um, a birth doula, um, and really just lover of all things birth and women's health and just, you know, getting unquestioned tradition questioned and asking a lot of critical questions and things like that. So Lindsay actually opened my eyes to a lot of this. I had also was curious, just like your wife and you are, and that's where I sought Lindsay and BirthFit out, you know, a handful of years ago. Um, and that opened my eyes to things. So yeah, it was, um, it's really cool to also talk about this with her because I learned a lot of what I know from, from her and from what she studied, um, which also came from like, Hey, I want to know more and her kind of pondering and being like, Hey, why isn't this information out there for people? So, um, yeah, it's really cool that we get to talk about this with those who are in that position we're expecting and we want to know more information, but like, where the heck do we start? Yeah. And I'll add that Leah is like our program director and the programming side of things. So all the fitness things, like she's pretty humble. She won't say that, but um, <laughs> like she wears that hat too. Um, yeah. For those of you like starting, it's a really big, fat, intimidating world of um, like trying to decipher between information and what's misconceptions, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, all that stuff. So like, I'm sure like you as new parents, you're like, oh shit, we're pregnant. Now what? Like, who do we go to? And then all of a sudden, especially when um, people start seeing a growing belly, everybody has opinions and um, they may not go with uh, your opinions or your beliefs or your value system. And so that's like the hard thing. And the, within this parenthood, motherhood transition, it's you know kind of an exaggerated or magnified experience on looking at who you are as a person, going back to your values, who you, like what you value as a person, what you value as a couple, what you want, like who and what do you want to be as parents and what do you want to like, you're kind of thinking about like, oh, this legacy I want to live, like give to the next generation and like what kind of beliefs and values do I want to instill in them? And so it's like constantly reevaluating your life through like just 40 weeks. And I say 40 weeks, but it's usually shorter. It's like 20 to 25 weeks before people realize, oh shit, like this is going to happen whether we like it or not. Um, so yeah, there's, it's a really magnified time of like soul searching. And um, not only that, but you're extremely vulnerable. Um, you are, there's a bit of fear mixed in there. And like you want to do the best thing possible for your kid. And then you got all these freaking opinions coming at you left and right. And then you have to actually decide, Oh, sh okay. Like 
do I listen to the for like government policy on this or do I go with my gut or you know all things like that come up so we can like unpack some of that but just like give an overview like I am in no way <laughs> jealous of the seat that new parents sit in you know I observe it you know all the time and it's just like ah oh, they're there's a big weight on their shoulders and a big weight on their heart. And, you know, most parents are doing the best they can with what they have. And I just want them to remember that. But yeah, there's a lot of deep diving that you got to do <laughs> when you find out you're pregnant or maybe even before, who knows? But um, yeah, not, not envious of that situation, but I'm here. I'm here. Like um, I think Leah will probably share, like I was her doula and I'm excited to be a part of the experience. Um, yeah, it's a big one for sure. Don't take it lightly. <laughs> I think it's, it's really cool that both of you are doulas. So that's, that's kind of the main thing that makes this so important is like your information is coming from a place of not only experience, but education at the same time. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And we get, we get the opportunities to see birth and, all forms right we get to see the hospital birth we get to see the home birth the birth center um the birth center that ends up being a transfer the hospital yeah. that ends up being a transfer to the birth center like we've got to see a lot of things and you know as we always say like your experiences shape you and i think for me as a mom i became a doula before i you know years before i became pregnant and um it was a really cool opportunity for me because every birth made me a little bit more certain of what I wanted for myself. Um, so, but yeah, there's, you know, it sounds cliche, but no two births are the same. No two pregnancies are the same. And so it's really cool to be able to remove yourself. Like we're not emotionally attached with those that we work with. Sometimes they're friends, sometimes they're family, but we get to take a step back and kind of be that person to hold the space to walk with them, um, but not projecting our experiences. Like I might want something for them, but that might not be what they want. Mm -hmm. And so the cool thing about being a doula is you're also constantly doing work on yourself and checking your own biases and making sure that you're showing up for them and not for yourself. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. So where do you, where is a good place for, people to start couples women uh to like soak up some good solid information and and background on s like just anything from movements to things you should and shouldn't be doing because you hear some people like you've got to be on bed rest you've got to take it easy you've got to stay home you don't want to like aggravate anything it's like this delicate little thing inside of your tummy and i say tummy and everybody laughs because that's just <laughs> what I'm um but like it is it is difficult because you, you can think about it that way or you have the reverse side of that where you have you know ladies that go into the gym and they hammer out these workouts and you see them lifting and you're like you can do anything ladies you can do whatever you want you know and do all this stuff so and then they kind of bicker back and forth but what you said earlier is they're all just opinions mm -hmm. so where would you where would you start in getting some facts and some legitimate information on that yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in and start and I'll go even further back. Like, um, if you're thinking about conceiving or you and your partners are ha having the conversation around pregnancy and birth, I would encourage you both, like, um, both partners, both mom, dad, whoever's in the game here to explore, like, go back and revisit your birth and how you came into this world. And for me, this was a big learning experience. So I've been a doula since um, 2010. I, almost, I was like 2009, no, 2009 is when I became a chiropractor. But 2010 is when I uh, became a doula. And it was, I did, you know, a handful of births. And then I went and explored my birth. And I asked my mom and my dad and then my aunt. And it's so interesting, just, you know, all three of them were there, but my mom recalls the birth a completely different way than my dad does. And then my aunt recalls the birth a completely different way than either one of them. Um, so 
I would explore that. Um, and then I would also try to get really clear on your values. And I know this is like not what people want to hear because sometimes this personal development stuff is the really hard stuff. Um, but I, it, like it goes a long way into actually diving in and getting clear on your preferences, like your birth preferences and who you want as your provider and who you want or where you want to give birth and how you want that experience to feel and then how you want that postpartum experience to feel. Um, so those would be the two things I would start with is getting clear on your values as an individual and then as a couple and then your birth experiences. Um, and for sure, for sure, this will probably bring up tears. Um, it will probably bring up like uncomfortable conversations, but start to embrace uncomfortable conversations because that's all there is in this motherhood and parenthood transition um, and well into the first year postpartum. Um, I don't know if Leah wants to add anything about preconception, but um, that's where I started. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's huge because, you know, within any good question, I think a good answer is always, it depends, right? So <laughs> you can't determine what information is right and what information is right for you until you know your values and you know what kind of birth that you desire to have, what lines up with your family, your family values. Um, like maybe I want something, but my husband wants something totally different. Like we need to get on the same page. Um, so starting early on with those conversations is so important because that's going to navigate you where it's like, hey, I feel safest in a hospital under the guidance of an OB. But I'm also not just going to go to any hospital, any OB and be like, all right, I'm pregnant. Tell me what to do. Like I've yeah. done the work to figure out my philosophy, what I want for myself. And now I'm almost in like an interviewing process. Like who meshes with me in one of the most intimate moments of my life? Who do I want to be in the room? Who do I want to guide me on this? If I'm going to meet with someone, you know, over the next 40 weeks, um, you know, a good amount of times, like we need to make sure that we are on the right page and I'm not dreading coming in to see you, that you actually care about me. And I feel like you care about me. I'm not just another one of your patients. So I think when you're, when you're seeking information for where do I start and where do I get information? Um, those questions are so important that, that Lindsay kind of laid out. And then I also think it's understanding that so much of parenting and decision making comes from trusting within. So like knowing your truth, your values, you're going to get science information. You're going to get hippy dippy information. Um, you're going to get the plus, like the full spectrum. And it's not that any of them are hundred percent right or any of them are hundred percent wrong, but it's going to be what feels best to you and so in birth it we speak a lot to the mother's intuition and like as soon as she's pregnant she has that intuition it's like i'm no longer just making a decision for myself something is coming up inside of me and i'm going to trust that that's the right thing to do for my for my baby so we talk about you know what kind of you know interventions am i okay with am i not okay with what you know vaccinations what am i okay with what am i not okay with those are all things where it's like hey before i was pregnant i might have been a hundred percent this is what i want but now that i have this baby inside of me something's coming up and telling me that it doesn't feel right and so that's gonna encourage you to explore more information and then the last thing I'll say there is also always kind of taking the best arguments on both sides and determining what feels the best to you. And so there's a great um, evidence-based birth puts out some great information because it's just information-based. It's not fear-based. It's not do this, don't do this. Um, but there's great information in there where you can read research and data and case studies and you can kind of determine like what's coming up for me and, you know, in my heart, in my brain, in my body, does this feel like the right decision? Or do I feel like someone's pushing me this way? Do I feel like I'm making this decision out of fear? So that's not giving you like a clear answer of like, go to this place and get this book and it's going to give you the answers. But it really goes back into finding those values, knowing your truth and what you and your family want, and then receiving the information that lines up best with what's coming up for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the fear-based thing is interesting especially with like with now like the times that we're in and all the negative stuff and the preaching about fear 
about everything. Like just everything is fear, 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 fear. And people seem to be drawn so crazy to this fear. Like, so everything is advertised and promoted as fear, whether it's to cover your own butt or whatever it is, like a doctor telling you, you can't move or you Mm -hmm. shouldn't move, or I can't suggest that you move like Mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, But that is something that's, how do you decipher between the, like, what is fearful and what is okay and healthy? Yeah. Well, I would say, um, you know, for one, fear is a big motivator and there's a lot of fear. If you just kind of step back and look at advertising and marketing in general, like just across the board, um, it's very fear based. And so when you get scared, you start reacting from this, this primitive brain. And, um, you know, on the simplest terms, like we have a very primitive brain and we have this thinking brain up front for one, you know, we want in birth, we want the primitive brain, but for all these like critical thinking, critical decisions, we don't want to make those decisions in this primitive brain. We want to make them with our thinking brain. Cause that's kind of what sets us apart as humans. We're able to like have a choice or at least recognize that we have a choice and decipher it. And we have language and we have free will and all this stuff. But um, if you just kind of take a step back, you'll start to notice how much fear there is on the news, how much fear there is in like a mar- like marketing campaign, even in magazines or newspaper or whatever. Um, and even when you go to the doctor, um, they'll like, and they're not, in their defense, this is kind of how they were programmed and conditioned in medical school, you know, very on that scarcity, fear-based victim mindset. And if you think back, that's pretty much how most of our society has been conditioned um, in this fear-based victim mindset. And like one of the things we like to say is, okay, receive the information, take a pause, and we're going to make a decision out of love and not fear. So when you're able to get to that place of love where you're loving yourself and maybe you have to say, like, sometimes I have to say to myself, Lindsay, I love you like five times out loud before I can actually make a decision. But like it, it allows you um, like a space between that stimulus and response to act rather than react. And I think that's, um, you know, really important in pregnancy, but also like as you get closer and closer to birth, like actually labor and birth, then you start to see this fear game play up even more, especially if you're in, um, you know, Western medicine setting like the hospital or working with midwives that are in a hospital. And like some phrases that'll come up is like, oh my God, your baby's measuring big. Or um, we don't want to have a stillbirth, or we don't want the placenta to stop working. And so there's these little plugs that, like, we've had a normal pregnancy all the way through, like, heart rate's checked out, mom's blood pressure's great, everybody's healthy, green flags all around. And then all of a sudden, we get to 39 weeks, or we get to 40 weeks. And all of a sudden, we're going to drop some lines like that. So that's just like planting these fear things in people's heads. And then you're like, oh, shit, we might as well induce because stillbirth. And that's, that, that's the, the only word you hear, you know. Um, so I think the more you can practice stepping back and observing and creating that space to make decisions, like it, it's a practice and that will carry over into the labor and birth setting. But if you haven't practiced that at all, you know, even on the simplest side of things, like walking into the grocery store and, you know, trying to collect yourself and, um, you know, how you interact with the people behind the cash register or the people at the coffee shop, or if you haven't practiced any of that, then that's certainly not going to show up in birth and you're going to, go to what your default is, which probably is making decisions out of fear instead of love, if that makes sense. No, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, And it's a difficult thing because 
the I like I like the way you explained it of of the gut intuition, like the like how you're feeling versus the fear. Am I doing this because I think it's right, or am I doing it because I'm scared of the outcome? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's like always so with always questioning it's like hey if that like red flag popped up that like hey don't exercise don't pick up anything over 20 pounds and don't get your heart rate above one above 140 and like just to take a step back and be like does that even make sense yeah because you know and if i do none of that now but then i go into labor like my heart rate's going to get above 140 um you know, labor is not easy. It's, it's going to be tough. So yeah, don't exercise for the next nine, 10 months, but then go into one of the biggest workouts of your life. And mm -hmm. then not only have you not picked something up over 20 pounds, but Hey, in two weeks, I need to see you back here for a visit and you're going to be carrying your baby in the car seat and you're going to be lifting it in and out of the car. Like, does that even make sense? And you know, maybe you ask that question and to you, it does make sense. But I mean, those were the things for me when I didn't even really know much about this whole world where I was like, this just doesn't make sense to me. And this doesn't match up with my lifestyle. And then it came into like, we put so much trust into somebody that has letters behind their name because they went to more schooling than us. And I'll be the first to tell you, like a doctor in the right setting knows a lot more than me in that setting. I'm not discrediting that. But we also know that, you know, a hospital and medicine is for the sick mm -hmm. and pregnancy is not a state of sickness. So if I have a healthy pregnancy, low risk pregnancy, like I don't need to go into that space to receive help because I'm sick. I just need to give birth. And we can do that in a very natural way that honors the processes that have happened for, you know, as long as we've been on this earth. And so I think one thing to note there too, is like Lindsay said, they're like, as a, as doctors doing the best they can with the information they have, but we also have to understand that they're also learning from outdated textbooks and information has evolved. And before it gets into the next textbook, it's already old information. Um, and one thing to note, which I think is just wild is the medical textbooks that they're still using are a version of what was written in a hundred years ago, 1920, when a middle-aged white male decided like, hey, I'm going to write a book on pregnancy. And prior to that, like granny midwives were, were doing most of the births and women, you know, less than 5% were giving birth in a hospital and we didn't have these interventions. And then comes, you know, someone who's like, hey, I could write a book on how we should actually give birth. And here's a list of interventions that'll make it go a little bit more seamlessly. We can save the woman from going through this if we do this instead. And so say that's 1920, we're in 2020, we just have a trickle down evolved version of that, but the information and the basis of that information, the lens that it was put in there is from that same place. So a doctor is learning from that lens and like I said, it's not to say that it's entirely wrong or entirely right, but there's more to it. And so it's asking those questions. I'm not going to put my trust a hundred percent in something that I know there could be more to it, or there could be a different answer or a different way of thinking. And that's kind of how I navigate or encourage folks to navigate that information of like, Hey, you heard it. It's not sitting right with you. Like what makes more sense to you? And like, follow that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would have, I, and and to your point, I, I definitely do not dog doctors because they're doing their job like 100%. I'm, I'm all on their side when I say this, but at the same time, like when you said you're not as educated as them on the, on the like medical side and the, they, they fix the problems, they fix the issues. They're not as qualified as you. I would go this far to say as to preventative measures before you even get to that fearful thing. So like the exercising part, you guys, you've lived it, you've seen it, you've studied it. You're more experts on that part of the process than they would be. Yeah. And I'll even add that you are the expert of your own body. Nobody knows your better, your body better than you do. And like Leah touched on a little bit, like giving power away I think we live in a society that puts power anywhere else 
but ourselves or puts ownership anywhere else so, like puts ownership puts responsibility puts power outside of ourselves and just on a personal note like when i hit rock bottom in my life that's when i had to own up like i had to own my actions own my consequences own all the shit that i did and start to rebuild from there so i think you know it's just kind of a symptom of the society we live in is you know that oh here save me take take away my power but hey like honey nobody's coming to save you like you got to save yourself um and nobody knows your body better than you do so if the gut in like the your intuition says something is off something is off for sure listen to that yeah and it's like it's a total team effort too like you're there navigating the team but your team is put in place to support you and so that's why like one of our pillars is connection because we live in this mindset that like you can only do it this way. If you're seeing an OB, only listen to your OB and do it that way. If you're seeing a midwife, only do it that way, whatever. But we're like, you need a team and one person like a, like Usain Bolt's 100, per, 100 meter sprint coach probably isn't his strength and conditioning coach, right? Somebody probably <laughs> knows a little bit more or he's, his sprint coach is probably not his nutrition coach. And so in pregnancy, it's the same thing. We tend to want to get all of our information from one source, but that's not what they specialize in. So like some of the work that I do locally is like, I want to meet more OBs. I want to meet more midwives so that they don't have to say, don't work out or don't do this. I want them to understand like, Hey, I've done the work. I've done the research. I understand this and I want to work with your clients because it's going to make a better birth experience for them, but it's also going to be an easier experience for that OB and it's going to lower their cesarean rate and they're going to have more ease in labor and you know, all of these things, but I'm, I'm also not a chiropractor. So I'm going to tell you when something hurts, I'm not going to say like, do this stretch and call it a day, right? I'm going to say, Hey, this person specializes in pregnancy and pediatrics and chiropractic and like they know all of those things I'm not going to pretend to but I know enough to say you should go see them and so that's a really cool thing too is like the birthing person is the navigator but their team is working for them and as like if I'm their doula I'm giving different information than if I'm their coach and if Lindsay's their chiropractor, she's giving different information than their midwife or their OB. But when we're all working together as a team, this mom feels empowered now because she's like, this is what feels right. My team is supporting me. We're all on the same page. And she's going to walk into labor and birth. Like, let's freaking do this. Like, I feel so supported. I have the best team ever versus walking into it being like, this is what I want, but this is what they're telling me. And this is where I feel pushed to. And I feel like, like, I don't have a say in this because ultimately in birth, like you are the main one that has the say, like you get to make the decisions. Nobody's making them for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, and I look at like what you said is like, oh, it's, a, it's crazy cool because you're, that puts you as the, as the mom or future mom in control of like, you're like the manager of a team or a head coach. And you're like, I'm going to pick my, the best players that I want on the field playing for me at this time. Or, you know, you're going into battle. You want the best soldiers that are going to be with you. At the same time, on the flip side of that, the reason I would think it'd be hard for people to accept that is if they do that, they're accepting the responsibility of the outcome. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but here, I would say like, like Leah's touched on earlier, it's like no birth is the same um we're all on our unique journeys in life and we all have these wonderful learning lessons that we came here earth side to learn whether you believe that or not but um there's unique journeys happening everywhere and one of the things i always tell my doula clients is at some point in this transition you're going to be fa face you're going to have to face the hardest decision of your life and that could be, you know, maybe at 36 weeks, baby still breach, and you got to decide if you want to go for a vaginal breach birth, or you want to go for a cesarean, or you want to skip all that and just say, wing it, like, let's go into labor and show up at the hospital. Like, those are decisions you got to make. Um, and so, you know, for me, that it's not going to be my hardest decision. 
my hardest decision shows up somewhere else, some in a different way. But I guarantee at some point within this, this motherhood transition, this parenthood transition, you're going to be faced with the hardest decision of your life. And that's why it's really important to know what's going on in here and your values and like your North star, your compass, how to navigate that. Um, because that's where you got to make those decisions from. Um, yeah. And it could, sh and I'll give you some examples like breech baby. How do we deliver a breech baby? Um, you know, that's a big one that parents have to make because we live in this society that's kind of like scared of breech, vaginal breech births. And it's just based on one study, one um, term breech trial that happened in 2000 in Canada. And since then that research study has been debunked, but all the, the since then the ob doctors in school, they have not been taught the skill of delivering vaginal breech. So now we're going back and trying to, the older generation, we're trying to get them to teach the younger, newer generation of how to deliver vaginal breech births. So that's, you know, in a nutshell, if anybody wants more information on breech, go watch the documentary Heads Up. You can get it on um, the internet, headsup.com. Um, but that's one example. Another example may be, um, you know, maybe you're a fitness instructor and you identify so much with your identity, your body, and then all of a sudden, maybe there's, um, you've, your doctor has told you you have um, complete placenta previa. And um, that means the, or the placenta is completely over the cervix. So it's like blocking the door on the way out. Um, if there's complete placenta previa, then there's no other way out but a cesarean. And so that may crush your dreams of this, um, you know, natural birth or this home birth or this, um, it may crush body dreams and recovery and all that stuff. Um, so that's a big decision. Um, another thing may be something on the other side, like maybe during birth, um, mom experienced um, some pelvic floor injury that has tears or, um, you know, maybe a prolapse. And so now on the other side, she's trying to decide how to recover. And so those are big decisions there. Um, decisions around breastfeeding. All of this is like huge. Um, so it's definitely going to challenge who you are at your core for sure. Um, and I yeah. think you can't attach your your self-worth to your birth. Like ultimately mm. we have control of a lot of things. Like we can do all the things and check all the boxes to lead us towards the birth that we desire. But ultimately like that part is out of our control. Yeah. And I think what's cool and, and one thing that I've heard that's always stuck to me is like, you will have the birth that you were meant to have. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, that's hundred percent different than the birth that we dreamed and that we imagined. But what happens when we do the work, because birth is traumatic, whether it happens exactly like you want it or radically different than you want it, like it's a traumatic, huge transitional experience. And you have to do work from that. But I think when you do the work, say I had a birth that I, I planned for intentionally, I did all of the things and then I got there and things ended up totally different like it doesn't mean that you failed or that you didn't succeed, but it means, Hey, God, the universe, like whatever it is, put this in your life because you needed it. And then part of doing the work is determining like, how did I grow from this? What did I need? What did this expose in me? Um, and I often see things come up in pregnancy where it's like, Hey, I'm feeling some like crazy energy or maybe it's body pain. Maybe it's just tension. Maybe, you know, something just feels off. And a lot of times that's like past trauma, past experiences that are coming up. Like we haven't worked through them yet. Mm -hmm. And you're going through this tra transformation and this transition and your body and like the divine is bringing this up so that you can do the work so that you can do what you need to do with your birth. But if we don't deal with those things ahead of time, they will come up in birth. They will come up in postpartum. Like they're going to come up. And so we talk about surrender and birth, but this whole motherhood, parenthood transition is so full of, of surrender. 
And that's so hard to do. And we can be aware of it, but actually going to the place of surrender is the toughest and bravest thing you can do. But if we don't go there, like we don't, we don't come, like the baby doesn't come, right? Like we have to go to surrender to have a baby. But in order for us to work through a lot of these things, it's a surrendering process and we can continue to suppress as long as we want, but they're going to come up. So I say that to give peace of mind that if you had a birth that you didn't plan on or it went different, like look at it as more of an opportunity to grow from what that was put in your path to show you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that also goes back to what Lindsay talked to in the beginning is digging into like how you were brought into the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, I didn't even think about this stuff, but some of the first questions providers ask you is how was your mom's birth? And did she go into labor on her own and this and that? And I was like, I don't even know that. And I had to ask my mom and she's like, well, I had a C-section with your brother. So I didn't even wait to go on labor. We just scheduled it with you. And I'm like, was I breastfed? No, we were on formula right away. And you know, like I had learned all this information. I was like, you mess me up. (laughs) That's what I I thought too. (laughs) Give me a chance. Um, But it also let me know that like, hey, I don't know if my mom would have gone into labor with me or if she would have needed to be induced, but I'm not going to base my experience on her experience, but I'm also going to learn from that experience. And I know what I want to do different, or maybe what I feel like would be the better choice for me and my family. So, um, all that to say is like, yes, your birth outcome is heavy and it's going to force you to work through some things, but there's no failure and how you bring your baby earth side. Like the baby is the boss, the universe, God, whatever is the boss. You are kind of the vessel that they go through, mm-hmm. but Um, it's all for a reason. And that should be more of an empowering thing than like a failure thing. Yeah. There's no right and wrong in this game. There's no succeeding or achieving or failure. Like you gotta get that out of your head during this for sure. I think that is the tough, that's the tough part right there, especially is the succeeding and failure. So that kind of leads me into like the thought that I had of, you know, so my wife's working out, right? And she's doing push-ups, and she starts to feel a little funky. So she goes to her knees and then she's like, Hey, this is feeling a little bit tender right now. It's okay to keep moving if she feels good in a movement, but just modify the whole entire movement or something. Um, and instead of just stopping for that reason, yeah. you know, it, and, and that sort of thing, but decide like, so to your point saying there's not a right or wrong, it's not wrong for her to keep moving. It's just changing it up on the fly on how she feels. Is that the best way you would describe that or am I totally off base? No, I would say, um, yeah, I was gonna talk about movement a little bit because we haven't even talked about that. But um, yeah, so many people come to us and they're like, okay, what exercises should I do and what should I avoid? And Leah's, answer from earlier is it depends um so back whenever i started the birth fit blog i was looking for it like books on exercise and fitness in pregnancy there there were none there was one and the one book is exercising through your pregnancy by james clapp and that's now over 20 years old and it has um majority of it has to do with endurance not strength training not body weight exercises nothing like that um but great re- like tons of research on um you know just the benefits for mom and baby so i will add like um you know pregnancy is the ultimate expression of health for a woman if you, like think about that for a moment there life would not be happening within that woman's human body if she was not healthy if she could not like if she could not keep a child so it's not a fragile state it is the ultimate health expression um so if we could just get that out of our heads in the american society that pregnancy is fragility it's the opposite um she's like a superhero um and by the end of yeah like we'll all witness this and by the end of pregnancy because um her oxygen and energy stores and everything's adapted 
she's almost operating like an Olympic athlete that has been doping the whole time. Not doping, but you know, I, one of my clients was an extremely fit firefighter and I would work out with her um, once a week and she would smoke me at the end of pregnancy and not even break a sweat. And you know, it was different things like imams, um, intervals, things like that. But she's like, Lindsay, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm breathing heavy over here. Like, hold on. Um, so yeah, pregnancy is the ultimate state of health. Um, and what I will say is, um, you know, whenever I was going, trying to find research, there was none. And um, I would ask midwives, I would ask ob guys, and the general consensus was what Leah mentioned earlier. Don't get your heart rate above this. Don't lift over this. And that initially struck me as like, wait, what? Um, like that does not make any sense because automatically within the first, you know, two weeks of birth, a mom is going to be asked to lift 35 pounds minimum, um, just to carry the baby, carry your handbag, carry, um, you know, the car seat, put the, and she's having to move. She's having to bend over, put baby down somewhere, grab something in the house, do something. Um, and so that just didn't make any sense to me. Um, and so whenever I started diving into this, and then right about the time, this time, um, CrossFit was taking off. And um, then you would see the extremists, like, um, you know, all the, all the extremes get put on the news, like the extreme ultra runner, or the triathlete, or the swimmer, or the CrossFitter. And that's what you see. And then you're like, oh my God, she's endangering her baby. Like I had an ultra runner that ran every day in her pregnancy and she ran probably 10 miles and then gave birth the next day. And then this was very early on. We don't allow running within the first 12 weeks postpartum now, but she was ready to go within six days of having a baby. And I was like, I don't know, but I probably wouldn't run 10 miles, maybe two. Yeah. Um, so that's what you see in the news and it's very sensationalized, but long story short, what I, realized and um you know i was lucky enough to have a chiropractic office in one birth center on the west side of la and a chiro office in the, a birth center on the east side so i was constantly surrounded by birth and what i learned was that that's what the midwives and the ob guys that's what they feared was this extreme that's that was they, they were making decisions based on fear around fitness mm -hmm. and most of the time when they got, let's say a runner or a triathlete or um, an extremely fit, super CrossFitter, um, and they, this would be their excuse, their pelvic floor is too tight or their muscles are too tight. And it's like, hold on, pump your brakes. Long story short, like what I realized was, okay, that could be, but maybe somebody hasn't taught these people how to actually surrender and meditate and visualize and relax trust in their body maybe they've only trained in one plane of motion as for runners or cyclists or spinners like if they're training in the sagittal plane motion the entire time that's not going to carry over very well into birth because birth happens in all planes of motion motion life happens in all planes of motion um, so for sure their hip flexors are going to be tight and that's going to alter the position of their pelvis and influence the front of the pelvic floor. Um, so those were things that I started uncovering. And one thing that we do in birth fit is like, we train in all planes of motion. Um, we train sagittal, coronal, like, uh, transverse, and we embrace full range of motion. So when you're talking about push-ups earlier, push-ups are going to go because belly's in the way. Like it's it's not comfortable, and it's it's going to gravity. It's going to weigh you down. So then we move to elevated push-ups. We want the full range of motion, and the priority is always going to be on a neutral spine during pregnancy and the early postpartum because that's where we come from the rehab world. So neutral spine, meaning rib cage stacked on top of a pelvis, 
and we're not like our pelvis is here and it's not dumping the water out the front or dumping the water out the back. So if we're, you know, in an elevated position for a push up and we can maintain this neutral spine, then we can still go all the way chest to the ground or chest touches the bench or chest touches the chair or whatever, then we're going through the full range of motion while bringing the ground closer to us, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, some of the things we think about are strength, balance, range of motion, um, endurance, and stamina, because we don't know if birth is going to be three hours, and we don't know if birth is going to be three days, but um, you got to train all three energy pathways. You got to tra train the aerobic as well as the glycolytic and phosphagen um, energy systems within the body because if you're giving birth and you know it's been three days of labor and then all of a sudden you got to push for sure you need some of that um, glycolytic phosphagen energy systems happening there like that would be like oh okay you want me to lift uh, you want me to do a one rep max deadlift cool I can do that now because um, that's kind of like what it might feel like then um so yeah, there's not a ton of information out there. The, um, the information I was uncovering at first was very fear-based um, scare tactics. Um, like there was one midwife in Los Angeles that only said walk, that's all you can do. And I was like, okay, I love walking, but that does not make any sense. Um, then the heart, the heart rate stuff, and I tried to uncover where the heart rate, like the number came from. And the closest I could get to um, researching that misconception was that it was done by an act like a male acupuncturist somewhere and um, at a conference. And that was as far as I got. It was like a dead end there. And then same thing, like most of what I started uncovering was that people were asked questions and they were afraid to say, I don't know. And so they just said a blanket statement. And I think that's, you know, it still happens today. People are like, oh, yeah, 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 just don't do, do this and do that. Just say, if you don't know the answer, say, I don't know, let me try to find it for you. Um, and so I think that's what we do a really nice job of at BirthFit, whether it's a BirthFit coach or a professional, or, you know, if we're digging in um, on a blog, like, hey, this is what we got. But again, this is the best of the information that we can find. And you know, you're going to still, you're going to have to make your own informed, intuitively guided choice, but this is what's out there, you know? Yeah. There's not much research in women's health in general. <laughs> and when you're taking that even further to like women's health in pregnancy, it's like, nobody wants to touch it. Right. Like, Hey, I'd love to know about like, I have an ice bath in my backyard. Can I get in that when I'm pregnant? It's like, who's going to touch that study? Like nobody's going to study right? a pregnant so, because it's unethical. Yeah. So it's like, we have to kind of guide what makes sense. And I think what BirthFit does really well with, within our program is we haven't, like we're not reinventing the wheel. We're using fitness, we're using exercise, general fitness. Like we're not making up new things, but we are tailoring our intentions to like in prenatal period, we're training for birth. Mm -hmm. We're no longer training for this competition, for um, for sport, for, you know, aesthetics, we're training with an end goal in mind. So for a lot of athletes, I think they're afraid to do like a pregnancy centered program because they think you're going to take all this stuff away from me. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. And it's like, Hey, this is no different than you training for your, you know, your meat at the end of the year, or whatever it is that you're training for. Now you have this intentional window like nine-ish month window where like the end goal is birth mm -hmm. and month one month two of training for something nine months off is going to look different than month seven and month eight and so all that we've done within birth it has taken all the things Lindsay said different planes of motion um different aerobic capacities um you know just making sure like balancing compensations moving through full range of motion and, and taking this and making it into a program that's taking you through this process to great game day because i can't tell you how often i'll see like hey this position's not working we need to open the pelvis baby's a little bit more stuck on one side like i need you to bring one foot forward get in a lunge to push baby out mm -hmm. and it's like hey if i haven't trained this like 
my hip flexors are tight. I have no idea how to do this. Like, but I'll see someone who's like gone through the whole process and they're like, cool, leg up, let's go. Let's push this baby out. Right. Or, you know, recently at a birth, it was, um, you know, like they were in water and baby got the head out, but didn't want the rest of the body to come out. Shoulders were a little stuck. And the midwife was like, Hey, I'm going to need you to get out of the water because she needed to just assist. Right. And it's not easy to get in and out of a tub with a baby's head in between your legs. Right? <laughs> I thought she was going to box jump out of the water. She's like, okay, like right to the floor, <laughs> like out of the tub. And it's just really cool as a coach who teaches this to like watch how it translates in birth. And it's like, they didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to go to their thinking brain. They just trained for the past nine months. So when this came up, it was natural for them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same. It's just as intentional on the postpartum side, right? now we're not training in season for anything we have basically a season of healing and we're going to rebuild and we're going to repair and we're going to establish a new foundation but it's no different than training with any other end goal we just have to get in the mindset that like hey we are training for this specific life event and i think that's where birth it does something different than anyone else is it's like you're still going to do all the things that you love to do we're just going to get really specific into this window of your life yeah I, I don't think i've ever like i have i've never heard it say so i can say like from mike like what i've read and gone over is that i've never heard it explained that way where you train for birth everybody's always considering it training so that they can stay skinny after birth no is that, we like that's that's yeah. what i hear the most that's that's the attitude you hear the most about that yeah that's I know. a whole other podcast <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a, it's like kind of what society is programmed in our heads and, you know, oh, let's get it. Let's bounce back. Let's get our pre baby body back. Sorry, but that body does not exist. We're not going to get that back. We're an evolved version of ourself. Um, and, you know, for me, like I used to work in the Olympic training world and what amazed me was that these people would train four years for like a hundred meter sprint or a long jump or freaking 10 seconds of their life, 20 seconds of their life. And that's when it started clicking for me was like, we have, you know, maybe 30 weeks of training and let's, let's shift the mindset. Like they train mind, body, and soul for the Olympics. Like you at like, um, I used to work with, um, some sprinters and, um, I was about to reveal their name, but we can't like HIPAA. Um, they would my, like they would watch everything they put into their body as far as nutrition, sleep. They would do visualizations. They would pay attention to the freaking shoes they wear when not on the um, on the track or not on the court or whatever. And so, with that kind of detail, it's like okay, let's bring that kind of intention over into the motherhood transition, into the parenthood transition, because it is a full body experience. It is a transformation. It will influence everything else after that. Um, you know, whether, whether you want it to or not. Um, and so that's kind of like where that came from was, hey, we're training for birth, mind, body, and soul. And it's a holistic approach to this, this rite of passage. Yeah. So to go along with everything that we've kind of talked about, cause I, I feel like we could have probably have like a hundred podcasts just on this <laughs> alone. Cause it's like, there's so many different topics and subjects to go with, but how does somebody like me from my side where, I mean, I'm not the one with the baby in my tummy, right? Mm. I'm not the one growing it. Like how do I support, this sort of like her making decisions and to keep moving and like, where do I come from and that sort of standpoint to help me? Cause Leah, when she was on the podcast last time, she said some things that really made me rethink about like, take a step back and like, okay, I need to really think about how I answer this, how I go about it. Cause my intentions are good, but the way it comes out is not working mm -hmm. um, or may not work. So <laughs> how would somebody like myself help out in helping her find out what's good for her and what she, you know, those sort of decisions, like what feels good to her? Yeah. 
I'll, I'll jump in first and then Leah can probably share a bit from her experience is, um, you know, whenever I'm working with clients, what I say is like, mom's going to be uber focused on baby and I need partner focused around mom so that she can focus on baby. So it's like partner is protecting the cave, protecting the space. You're protecting the birthing parent. Whereas the birthing parent is all about that baby. Um, so it's like this beautiful, I guess, circle or bubble that encompasses another circle or bubble. Um, so if you can kind of visualize that, that helps, especially when you're in like the birth scene and maybe you're at the hospital or the birth center, like getting the space all ready, protecting the space. You're the one that's allowed to use your thinking brain now mom birthing parent is not allowed to use their thinking brain they got to go inside their body and they got to learn the dance the rhythm of labor and birth um that said what i will say is communication is huge um you both are having this experience and it's not at all the same um it never will be the same you're both at this dinner table and even though you're eating the same food, maybe you're drinking the same bottle of wine, maybe you're, you have the same waiter, you're having completely different experiences at this dinner table. So if they're, your fears, your desires as a partner are legit, 100, legit. So maybe, and this happens a lot, um, I get partners that are like, Lindsay, can you just talk to my wife or can you just talk to my partner? Like, I want to have a birth center birth, but she doesn't, or I want to have a hospital birth, but she does, or whatever, you know, they're not lining up on something. Um, and it's got to involve a conversation, and it's got to involve a conversation from not an emotional space. Um, tough. Tough. So, it's so tough. So what I would do, especially either person is like, you know, you maybe you recognize like, oh, shit, okay. I had this fear and I'm thinking of one of my couples and particularly um, he had um, a baby brother pass away. And so he was very fearful of childbirth just in general, even though his baby brother didn't pass away in childbirth for some reason that kept coming up for him. Um, but he didn't want to say that to his, his wife and I get why he didn't want to say it, but, like keeping something in is never, never a good idea. Um, so getting clear on how you, what your fear is, how you want to communicate this. And maybe that's you working with an outside therapist. Maybe that's you um, connecting with the midwife or the ob guy and saying, hey, how do, like, what's the best way? Or I have questions around this. Can you help me out with like, what are the risks and benefits here? Um, and then bringing that to the table and you know, saying to your partner, hey, I really would like to discuss something. Um, this is kind of the subject matter. When is a good time to discuss that? You know, and this is like relationship skills we could all use, but um, asking them if you could discuss something around a certain subject and when is a good time? Are you open to discussing that? They may say no. <laughs> they may say, nope, I'm not open to discussing that. And then you got to figure out how to work it out somewhere else in your head, um, maybe with somebody else. But if it, more times than not, they will say, yes, I'm open to discussing that. And so then it gives them time to kind of like let the emotional, the emotions that are, have been charged kind of like fizzle out. Like even if you give them a prep, like, hey, can we talk about where like our birthing location. Could we talk about it sometime this weekend? And then maybe she's like defensive, but you're saying, I, I don't even want to talk about it till, till you're ready. You know, when's a good time for you? Um, so then it allows time and space for those emotions to kind of like chill out. Um, same thing for the birthing parent. Like if you want to talk to your partner, it's really great. Hey, I want to talk about this. When is a good time? Are you open to that discussion? Um, and also I'll say if there's any birthing parents that are listening, if you need something from your partner, I would use the something along the lines of, Hey, 
this is a need I have. Can you help me with this? Or can you like specifically identifying the need and mm -hmm. asking for specific help um, goes a long way because your partner cannot read your mind, whether you think they can or should, or they cannot at all. And this is really important postpartum because now the first two weeks are survival mode and both of you are running on no sleep and some everybody's got needs, but nobody's needs are being met. And maybe it's just like, hey, I need 30 minutes by myself to drink a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Can you, can you help me make that happen today? And that goes a long way. Um, that's what I would say. Communication is key. I don't know if Leah wants to add anything. Yeah. I mean, I think communication is always the, the winner in this, but I think like having a third party, someone to help facilitate these conversations, like for me, I had Lindsay as a doula, we would do our consults and she would meet and she would have exercises for us to do or homework for us to do that encouraged it. So it wasn't like, Hey, Leah, you need to go bring up this conversation or Asia, you need to bring this up. It was like, Hey, here's an open space. Do you guys want to talk about anything? And then like, here's some things I want you guys to do before we meet next. And so that really helped because there's no defensiveness. There's no like, why is he bringing this up? You know, it's just like, Oh, that makes sense. We need to spend some time together, have these conversations. Um, the other thing that Asia always does that drives me crazy, but it's really effective is, um, you know, when, when you want to share something, because, and coming from a place of like, I really care about her. I need her to hear this and not just go on the defense, always asking permission. Like, Hey, I see that, you know, you're doing this, this, and this, um, would you be open to hearing how I feel about it or how I think that it could be better? Um, and I know the cues, like I know what he's doing when he's doing it, but immediately, <laughs> instead of him being like, hey, why don't you do this instead? And me being like, well, what's wrong with the way I'm doing it, right? It's like, yes, I'm open to hearing it. And like, I might not have a response right away, but I'm hearing it from a place of openness because he asked permission and I accepted. So I think that's a really big one. And then lastly, like, I just appreciate his, like his respect and his trust in my mother, motherly intuition. Um, and I think he understands that I have things that come up that he doesn't feel like if it's, you know, I'll just use like a polarizing topic. If it's like a vaccine and I'm like, do I want to get this? Do I not want to get this? And like, Hey, what do you think we should do? And he's, we're really big on like, Hey, we'll always come back to our values. Here's like, I have my individual values. He has his individual values. We write those down, but then we collectively come together and here's our values for our family. And so every decision that we make is based on, does it line up with these values? But when it comes specific to that, like I know where his values lie, he's, he knows where mine lie, but I'll come to him and be like, well, what do you think we should do? And like, he's not afraid to say, hey, I'm going to trust what you think is best in this situation. Now, if I was choosing to do something completely out of line with my values or our values, he would step in, but I really appreciate, and it, it, it forces me to take ownership and again, make a decision from like my truth versus being like, I'm fearful to make this decision. So I want you to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I really love that he like almost takes his place on the side of me and not like, I'm going to make the decision for you, but like, I'm going to encourage you to make this decision because you have something coming up in you that I don't have. And I think that's a really big one. It's just allowing, it's almost like the masculine and feminine thing. Like for this, like we're two very masculine people, but pregnancy and motherhood is such a feminine thing. And I think his masculine side has to let my feminine exist and not just encourage me to go like masculine mode, decision-making all the time, like know what you're going to do. Like he has to encourage that softer side for me to go to that place. So mm -hmm. those are things that have been effective in my personal experience and things that I feel like that's what I like would hope happens in, you know, other homes or other decision-making factors that the partner is willing to step back and just recognize that, Hey, like the mom knows like deep inside, like I know what's right. And I know what I want to do. Um, and I, I can't just rely on his validation of that. Mm, mm -hmm. That, that is probably the best way I've heard it put is, and because the attention coming from is like, not for me to control anything or make any decision. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it makes it okay to just go, you got to listen to your gut on this. But really the most important part, what I got of what you just said is the most important thing I can do is recognize when she steps outside, what her values are is to just point that part out. Mm -hmm. 100%. And I think, yeah. you know, those conversations, like we try to have them yearly because values change. And then mm -hmm. you become a parent, you have a new baby in this world and your values might be totally different. But when I can recognize his and he can recognize mine and we know ours collectively, like I don't need to speak up until I see him like living outside of that. Or if a decision we're making together is outside of that, then it's like, hey, we need to have a conversation. But otherwise, I'm going to trust that he knows what's best for him and he's going to trust that I know what's best for me. Mm. I don't, oh, go ahead. I, don't, what? I was going to say, don't be, don't be scared to get a doula. Um, for the yeah. whole birth experience because a doula can really enhance um, kind of y'all's relationship and a good doula won't come between the two of you. Like I remember um, with Leah and Asia, like I would step in and then Asia would watch me and then the next, the next contraction, he was doing what I was doing and I was back. Like Asia's a quick learner, like I'll give him that, but um, like, freak freakly like a quick learner but um it's like okay like yes this makes my job easier but um yeah being able to just observe and then pick it up and go with it go with the flow and you could tell so much during birth that he trusted he had so much trust in Leah and was just like I'm ready whenever you need me however you need me you know and Which that's I what I needed from him mm -hmm. <laughs> just like hey don't talk to me. Don't try to cheerlead. Like, I just need to know you're there and that, you know, I can do it and I'm good. And so like, that's, that's where the doula comes in. It's like, you know, part of our homework is like, you know, what are your love languages? How are you going to receive help from him best? How is he going to receive from you? Like he needs to know what I need from him and not just sitting there like, should I try this? Should I not? But <laughs> equally, like I need to know like how he's going to feel most supportive. And so just channeling that and then your doula knows and she knows like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to take a step back. Like they have it. Right. So mm -hmm. like, those are really great things where like you can support in a way that helps each other out. And it's not just about her, but like, you're also in the picture. And I think a lot of times the partner's like, she's doing the thing. So I like, what can I do? It's like, you can do a lot and a lot can happen by him just sitting next to me. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I know we're on the same page, but I don't need anything specifically from him. So yeah. yeah. So powerful. <laughs> Coming from a doula, I still had a doula. Like you can know all of the things, but when you're that person, you're not in your thinking brain, like you need that person. A coach needs a coach. That's 100% true. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been fantastic. I let everybody know where they, cause I'm big fans of the birth fit thing. Uh, and by the way, I just got to make this comment. I have been saying, I have been saying since the moment she got, like we knew when we found out, I'm like, you have developed superhuman powers. You can hear everything like three houses down. You can smell every, I'll make a sandwich and she's like, she'll wake up at 4am when I'm up. Are you making something? I can smell it. I'm like, you've got superhuman powers. This is incredible. So you made that post and I shared it. I was like, look, see, I was right. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But let everybody know where they can find out more about BirthFit and the programs and how they can hire you guys and go to seminars and all that good stuff. Yeah. So we were actually going to do a seminar in College Station. And, um, this year I, I was talking to somebody, but seminars are like not happening right now. Um, we have a virtual summit that is happening um, June 6th. That's all about postpartum. And the cheapest ticket is 39 bucks. If you go to summit.birthfit.com. Um, our website is birthfit.com and you can go in there and the blog exists on there, like tons of free information on the blog. Um, we have a birthfit podcast where you can get tons of free information. And then we have online programs. And so what I mentioned earlier, like, um, Leah just helped and we just completely redid our postpartum timeline, which I could not be more stoked about. Like, um, we have a free 30 day lion in program. Um, and anybody that signs up for our newsletter gets this program and it's super chill, super gentle. 
um, like one video a day of like breathing exercises, embodiment practices. And then they move into the Birth It Basics postpartum program, which is a 30 day program, um, all about body weight movements and um, connecting with your breath and connecting with the stability breath and basically how to stabilize and move starting with body weight stuff before adding load, adding volume, any of that. And then you go into the birth fit postpartum training, which probably starts to look a little bit more like training that people are used to. Um, and that's a three month, 12 week thing. And um, then they can join the B community is what we've been calling it, the B exclamation community for just general strength and conditioning. But um, we have a prenatal program. We have other little small programs. We have a postpartum meal prep program that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Am I missing anything, Leah? Um, I think you covered it. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a plethora of knowledge that's free. Yeah. So get on. Like, yeah. if you have a question, I typically say, if you have a question, type in that question and attach birth fit to it, and a blog's going to pop up. Like, mm -hmm. can I lay on my back while pregnant? Birth fit. Um, can I exercise with pregnant birth fit? That's a really great way to just start with information. So if you're just looking for some, some good information, the birth fit podcast, obviously, and then, um, like following birth fit on Instagram, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's constantly drops there, but the summit, anyone who's going to be postpartum is newly postpartum, or you're supporting someone postpartum. The whole theme of summit is postpartum this year and there's some really great stuff and speakers on there too so um that's coming up and since we're all in the virtual world anyways what else <laughs> have to do right <laughs> oh that's super awesome i did not know you guys were doing that that's really really cool idea and super affordable at 39 dollars. like i had to say and that's not like a sales pitch towards towards anything i expected more so that's like ooh, that's awesome I mean, the live experience was definitely more because it was three days. Everybody flew in, but we we made the call in March. We're like, oof, we got to change this. I think that so, was a, like coming like from the outside in. That's a good call because it's yeah. virtual. You're still live, but you're not in person. Mm -hmm. So you make it like according to the times. I like it. I dig it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very awesome. All right. Oh, don't forget. Don't you have another podcast that you do too? Do you do the coffee talk? Is that you? Oh, oh, I have a personal Instagram, Lindsay underscore K underscore Matthews. And then every day I post a coffee talk kind of wording on there. You're like the, I swear, like I've had four people in the last week be like, can I get that coffee talk podcast link? I'm like, it doesn't exist. But um, <laughs> uh, I think whenever the book comes out, I'll do a short coffee, a uh, coffee, a short podcast to go along with it, like 10 to 20 minutes. Um, just kind of like uh, unpacking some of the, the stuff that's in there. We'll see what happens. But for now, it's just on my Instagram. Awesome. Perfect. That's what I need to know. Thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate yeah, it. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Yeah.